being here on my Saturday, the end of my art week. And thank you so much for all of you being here. Very um, Especially people who are coming in from Abu um, Dhabi. And um, so this is our second exhibition and the second lecture of our lecture series. And uh, I would just like a moment to thank uh, some people here without whom this initiative is just not possible. And I would like to thank uh, Amiruddin Tanawala from the Ismaili Center, as in Virgin, and Barberji, and Farad, who has just provided us with the most incredible support. The CEO of Her Highness, Sheikh Hassan bin Hamdan, my young family, she was here with us, and uh, thank you so much for being with us here. So, um, we move on to the star of the show today. And um, we are really delighted to have Marina Tabassum with us. She is the principal of Marina Tabassum Architects, a practice established in 2005 based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And she's also and is the winner of the Al Khan Award for Architecture Cycle 2016 and has just recently been appointed as a member of the steering committee of the Al Khan Award for Architecture, which is absolutely amazing.
person who's living in the Delta. And here you see that you know, at certain time of the year, it's entirely flooded because there's water. And it's taken, people generally fish when there is enough water. And then at a certain time of the year, the water would recede and you'd find land. And then they start cultivating. So you cannot draw any line between what is water and what is land. So it's just a constantly changing landscape. And what happens is basically that what gives people their kind of identity, the resilience and um, the informality of living, uh, and appropriation in a certain way. Uh, this is another interesting image I always show, which is when there is a dry season when the rivers do not flow as much, so there is stagnancy of water, and you find water hyacinths growing in the water. And the rivers cannot, people cannot take their boat across from one side to the other side because of the enormous amount of water hyacinth. So they bring their boats together and creates a boat bridge. So I think this is how people adapt. I think it's a wonderful example of showing how people adapt to a landscape. And optimization is also important. <laughs> Climate, I think, uh, is an important thing to also notice that the Tropic of Cancer actually cuts through Bangladesh, right there. So it makes it a subtropical climate where we have uh, half of the year monsoon, where we have uh, a good amount of rainfall, and then half of the year there is this dry season when there is no rain. And rain being in the summer is something we celebrate. It's a blessing. And that makes the fertile land even more fertile and prudent. And then we also have a small dry season, which is quite dusty because the earth is so soft and fragile. So how do you do architecture in a country like ours, which is a subtropical climate? And I think this is one of the most primordial examples that you can see. That all you need is basically the roof on your head. And you can keep it absolutely as open as possible. You let the air in and out. All you need is a roof to cover you from the elements and the uh, wind from the water. And this is architecture. So this was what was proven by Mazar al-Islam, one of the first architects of Bangladesh, who was also, I think, one of the first uh, a member of the jury of the other one was in the 77 or sometime around that time. Um, this is a building from the 1952. Uh, it's our fine art institute which is designed very much like a pavilion. And I think the tropical modernity in Bengal or in Bangladesh, uh, we see uh, this as the first example of the building. And in my projects also, one of my works, and very early works, where we were designing in a small apartment, the top floor of a building, where we actually used the wall as a facade, which can open up, and it basically opens like a pavilion. So the entire space, you can either close it or open it, however you prefer. And there is also a space, like a nature court, we call it. The other important factor, especially where we live, um, one of the major elements is the courtyard. So this is a courtyard where I grew up, so I always like to share it. Courtyards are absolutely the, uh, the heart or the soul of a household, because it keeps the temperature cool, it allows the airflow. So if you see that image over there, this is for this project, where we created this high volume of uh, a courtyard which is open to sky. This is also something you see in the mosque, uh, that we like to create opening uh, so that air can always have a place to stay. So there's a constant draft of air being introduced. Because in the subtropical, especially in a humid, hot humid climate, it's very important that you keep on, uh, keep the spaces ventilated. So how to keep a space ventilated has become one of the major obsessions in my architecture. And that's the section of that apartment, you can see here, the courtyard from the top. This project was uh, nominated or shortlisted for our awards in 2004, a long time ago. We didn't win at that time. So um, this is, again, the same idea of a courtyard, which is absolutely the center of the space. Uh, 
this is one project I designed. Uh, it was a nine square grid, very small project. But this is also somewhere we investigated in this idea of a portrait and an atrium uh, built in grid. And this also has these corners cut out to so create this graph. So porosity, as I mentioned, that it's important to have porosity uh, to be able to make sure that the buildings breathe. So to make the buildings breathe, it's important to make it as porous as possible. And these are some of the projects, uh, ideas that we did. This is one building which is a 12 story building we designed in Dhaka, uh, where we've opened up the facades on the, on the east and west side to allow the allow enough airflow to take place. And this is also on a very major highway or you know, one of the major uh, roads in Dhaka which remains quite uh, jammed quite often. So this is what it looks like. It's a city facade in a way it allows ventilation at the same time it gives a facade which is much more for the city rather than uh, for anything else. Brick is our material. We've seen quite a bit of brick. Why brick is a material? Because it is a delta and we do not have any kind of stone in, in our landscape. So what we have is earth. And earth, we break it in brick and that has been used. This is a monastery from the uh, second century BC. So from that time onwards, brick has been our material uh, in architecture. Even in Hindu temples that are there in our, in our land, you see brick being used or even terracotta, intricately curved out terracotta. And so we have wonderful brick basins, both, in, uh, both men and women who work in the construction industry. And uh, some of the best uh, brick basins are from the North Bengal. And this guy in the middle uh, is one of the winners of the Arakan Award. Uh, because he was the designer for the mosque. <laughs> he did the brick work. So, yeah, it has, you see a lot of brick being used in the landscape. So, tactility is important, the tact tactile feeling uh, of the space. Acknowledging the power of tactility and, uh, you know, the sensory perception of the elements is important. Uh, things are all handmade, everything is. 12-story building that I showed you is handmade. A 30-story building is also handmade. Mm -hmm. So you not, won't see so many cranes in the sites. It's mostly people carrying loads of things. So crafting with hand comes with its own quality. It's imperfect. It doesn't, it's not machine finished. But that's something we think needs to be celebrated. So uh, here again you see how everything gets done. All done in brick, I mean, all done in hand, crafted base, mosaic. So that's something we also celebrate, crafting in hand. So this is Dhaka. I don't have a pointer to show you, but if you see the pink area, which shows the density uh, with all the waters around it, that's actually uh, Dhaka uh, as a capital. We have a river on this edge down here, which is the Old Ganges, or Bhuliganga we call it, and it's lined with another uh, river which is on the northern part uh, that basically defines the city and there's water on both edges. And it is home to 20 million people, one of the densest cities in the world, one of the fastest growing cities in the world, it's a mega city, it's a chaos. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you will handle it, but we are trying our utmost. Um, to figure out what to do about it. It's, it's an intense pressure of people because people need to come to the city to live. Um, so one way would be how you can uh, sort of decentralize a lot of things. And there's also government policy related issues which the government needs to look at as well. Um, but the next project, the reason I'm showing it is because the next project uh, is a project which I did when I was right after my graduation. Uh, within two years of my graduation, we uh, actually uh, won a competition uh, to design a museum 
which is not very common. <laughs> um, and it's a very intense uh, project. So I would like to just basically touch upon the history a little bit uh, of the birth of Bangladesh uh, to be able to proceed to the project. So these two maps that you see uh, done by the British uh, Empire um, in the 1909s that shows the population density of Hindus and Muslims in the entire subcontinent. And the red map shows the Hindu population, the darker the red, the density is much more. The green shows the Muslim population, the darker the green areas are the concentration of Muslims. And in a way, based on these consensus, um, the Indian subcontinent was divided. And um, it was done in a rush, as we all know. Many of us are coming from the subcontinent. And of course, this idea of Pakistan came up, where uh, we had East Pakistan and West Pakistan. And in between East and West, there was 700 kilometers of land. And if you know the Indian subcontinent, travel 100 miles, you'll find a completely different culture, completely different language, totally different uh, uh, food habit, clothes, everything is so different. And then when you actually travel like 700, 1700 kilometers, you can imagine the difference in culture. What I just mentioned in the very beginning, that uh, the uniqueness of the identity of people is very important. So, this whole idea of uh, a nation which, is, which has two different lands in, in East and West, uh, I don't know who came up with it, <laughs> but it definitely did not work. So one of the major forced mass migration, as we know, happened during the partition of this entire subcontinent. And from 47 to 71, it has been a kind of a struggle between both uh, east and West, um, it probably, in a way, it shows that only religion cannot keep you together. I mean, this whole identity issue or the culture is also something very unique and important to understand. So definitely there was trouble, there was an intense war, which uh, was there for nine months, starting from March to December, which ended uh, in 71. December. And then in 1997, uh, the government decided that they want to build a liberation war museum that will commemorate the history of the war and the birth of Bangladesh, at the same time um, keeping the history alive. And so they had a competition that was uh, uh, launched, a national competition. And as, it, as I mentioned, that I was uh, right after two years of my graduation, so we were small, very new farm, and we participated in the competition. And our design idea was that it was the site you see here, right in the middle, here in this large green patch, which is uh, one of the rare green parts still living in the city of Tanka, which is a great million. And within that park, we were supposed to design a museum uh, with a research center, facilities and other things. And so the idea was you have a park, we build a building in the middle of the park. It just you know, takes away a lot from the city people who rarely have a great place to go to. So that became a challenge in this project. And then of course the history of the space is also important where the site is located. During the British time it was a horse racing ground. Between 47 to 71 this was a politically active place. And then this is also the place where the, our father of the nation, Shekhi Dibiraman, actually gave his 7th March speech, which actually triggered the entire, uh, you know, this separation between the two land and to become of Bangladesh. And in December, this is also where the uh, surrender happened. So basically, that's a very important location to, to actually place the museum. But at the same time, it's a park. And if you see here, you can see the green patches of the city. You see the parliament complex up there, which shows some green areas. And this is actually where you have the, some of the green places. So the idea was that to take the minimum of space that we require to build a museum. So we placed uh, 
uh, we created a, a sort of a plaza, which is not above ground. It's just five feet above ground maximum, so that your eyes do not get uh, obstructed by any elements. And we created just to the minimum of footprint that was required. We created a, a, a reflecting pool and a walkway around it. And that's really all we did. So it's the way we designed it is like uh, it's it's a it's a journey. You walk up the plaza, you go there, you see a, a, a certain elements, the first element you encounter is the seventh March monument. Then there is this water body, which is a circular water body, which has a certain little hole where the water gets drawn into the space. And at the end, you find the tower of the Independence Monument. And if you look at the section, you basically took the museum underground. So the entire museum is below grade. You don't see anything on top. It's a non-building approach where you've taken the entire museum below grade. And if you see all the different sections, this is how it is. The museum is below, the plaza. So the idea was that there is duality in this whole concept of uh, freedom or independence. There is, of course, a celebration of being free, being a, a new nation, uh, looking into the future, celebration, which is all on the plaza. And the history of war, the sadness of losing people, the struggle, everything you've taken into the ground. So it's all within you. So it's something that you hold inside, and the celebration is all outside. That's the museum, under, underground, and um, as I mentioned that we started the project in 1998, uh, after, the, after we won the competition, and it took us 16 years to finish it. <laughs> so, uh, because you know, the political, this is a politically motivated project, so in the beginning, there was a lot of interest and the new government came in, the project got stopped, and then again uh, it started. So basically, in 2013, we were able to finish it uh, with the tower. So this is what it looks like. I'll show you some images. Uh, so when you go down by the ramp, and then you come down. It's a very, as I said, that it's a 16 year long project. So even the walls, since it stopped and went on, everything you see that the, the building actually has those marks of history of its being a uh, being. <laughs> so it's an historical uh, you know, building that owns history. At the same time, it has its own history of making. So these are all the different uh, images uh, that are printed on glass and posed there. There's a small area which we call the dark exhibit area where images of genocide are there. And then from there you enter into that space where you have this circular water column that's coming from the top. And there is no exhibit here. It's just a very contemplative space where you enter. There's only, the only light coming through is the through that oculus in the top. And um, you just take a moment and you remember the people that has been lost. Wars are never nice, it's not great. There is loss on every side, there is no winner anymore. So we will ju I'm just going to go through the images, show you. And then you go up. There's a small video, which I hope I can...
can hold light and refract light. So what you see here is the plan of that tower. It has a space frame structure in the middle. And then the glasses are basically not sheet glass. The glasses are stacked on top of the other. And basically that's how it's created. Here you can see a little bit that glasses are actually used in sections, so they are stacked to create a kind of a prismatic effect. So when there is light passing through the element or the medium of the glass, it refracts. When it refracts, it gives a nice glowing effect. And in the evening, we light it artificially so that from the outside it's lit, and you see this beautiful uh, glowing light. So it's a beacon of hope for a generation, for a young nation which was born in 71, uh, something uh, to look forward to. That's also again during uh, you know, in the night. And um, on the 16th of December, when we have our Victory Day celebration, it's packed with people. And we have concerts and everything going on in the plaza. And the park is a vibrant space. So that's Dhaka. People of 20 million. And it's dense, as I mentioned. So the city constantly grows because there are and coming to live there. So when I was given this site and the roof that you see in Buddha over there is over there as well. Uh, I remember going to these places when I was a child because my family owned land in that area uh, towards the edge of the city. And uh, it used to be farmland. It was absolutely farmland. And, um, and then there was this constant pressure of people coming in and there were a lot of uh, people buying land uh, to build their own houses. So there was a settlement. And within the last 20 years, it, it has turned from farmland to complete settlement. So that's why, and it's not even within the city. City corporation did not include it within the city limit, but it is part of the city. So there was no uh, facilities that were provided by the city in that location. So my grandmother, who actually uh, owned land in that location, decided to, to give a domain to a small part of land to build a mosque. And she said, you know, it's just a space where people can come together and enjoy. And since there is nothing else around, there is no community center, no other community facilities, we should design it in a certain way that people can use it as much as possible. So if you look at these images here, from 2004 to 2000, and have to do 2015, how this entire space is constantly changing and shifting from being a farmland to slowly becoming uh, a settlement where people are living. And the mosque is over there somewhere. I wish I had a laser pointer. <laughs> but anyway, so that's my grandmother. And, um, and you can see her sitting over there. It was our groundbreaking ceremony in 2006. And at that time, still, it was a very, very uh, village-like atmosphere. And there was nothing, so I remember Jeffrey Tree, we did our first prayer, and she declared that this is a space he's, she's donating for building a mosque. Um, so the project came in, and of course, uh, these are the issues that I basically kept in mind, going back to the beginning and questioning what is a mosque searching for the connection with the big body legacy, addressing the location as a settlement in transition, thus looking within and not without, spirituality as the main element of design, as opposed to uh, addressing symbols, using light as the main source of spirituality, engagement with the community to grow sense of ownership, keeping the basic elements of architecture there in so these are some things you already see. So this is, of course, uh, going back to the beginning and questioning what is a mosque. And when you go to the beginning, you have to definitely go back to the beginning of the Prophet's time when mosque came into being. And it basically gener generated from the house form. So there was no specific form for mosque as such. It was, the beginning was a house form. So from houses it was generated. And if you look uh, into the history of Islam, you see that mosque was not only meant for prayer. It was a space 
which was more a communal space, a social space where people came together um, to congregate, and not only for prayer but for other social uh, communal activities. And uh, there were a lot of things that took place, a lot of act uh, actions. It was a place for administration. It was also used for a place of judiciary. So there was a lot of things that actually happened in the mosque, uh, which later on. Everything went off and it's only now used as a prayer space, especially in the subcontinent, mostly also in Bangladesh, that you just do the five times prayer and the rest of the time is just empty. And to remain a space empty uh, just didn't feel like the right thing to do. <laughs> so I thought that it would be interesting if we can generate more uh, different kind of activities into the space, keeping the respect of religious uh, feelings. And if you look into the morphology of mosque form, you see from that small house form, later on, with time, uh, mosque has grown, and as it has gone east and west of the Arabian Peninsula, it has taken different shapes and different forms based on the culture, it, uh, it, uh, culture place, construction, techniques, everything adapting to it and making it their own. So there is also this whole notion of contextuality that is very much present in mosque form. And the other thing which I find quite interesting is also the spiritual quality of the space where you enter, where you want to be in communion with God. Uh, so that's also something quite interesting. And this is the mosque that you see in Bengal. So, um, Islam came to Bengal in the, ninth, the 13th century. So around that time, these are the kind of mosques that were built. And these are probably the most unique and authentic mosque forms that are available in Bengal. Um, built with brick, the construction techniques were quite similar to even a temple architecture. Because those are the people or the masons who were building mosques too. So there is this connection. But now when you go to Bangladesh, see mosques, this is what you see. So the entire um, uh, the morphological development is completely lost. And this is what has happened to the symbols. Hmm. Uh, so uh, do you really need that? That's the question. Do you really need a dome and a minaret to basically, you know, like coming out of nowhere? Um, so so that, those are the questions I get to ask you. And that's the location. This is quite interesting because this is where I developed my entire idea from. The monastery, Buddhist monastery from the 2nd century BC, uh, Hindu temple, that's a Muslim mosque from the 13th century, and that's the parliament building plan. So I kind of brought them all together in a certain way and uh, created my own design idea, which is over there. Uh, it's bringing brick, again, the same material. And uh, as you know that in Islam, Qibla is an important uh, element um, in a prayer hall especially. So I added a circular element into that to facilitate that direction of Mecca, um, the Qibla direction, which is 12 degrees from my site. So that went on through a process. Uh, these are the sketches I made, the uh, models. And here you can see uh, that the brick is surrounding uh, the entire prayer box. The prayer box is basically a, uh, a pavilion, as I showed you in the beginning, that all you need is a roof. So it actually represents that. Uh, the prayer box is basically just a roof and a plinth and it's surrounded on the sides, uh, wrapped with a brick structure. And we kept it brick because brick is cheaper, uh, easy to construct with, and uh, my budget for the project was very, very limited, so we had to keep it, keep concrete as little as possible in the entire structure. So that's the ground floor plan. Some sketches again, the upper level. You see the elevation, which is sort of creates a connection with the older architecture that you see in Bengal. And 
and the perforated brickwork to allow ventilation. As I mentioned in the beginning, that perforated or breathability of the building or a bed form is very important. So that's what we created. And this is the context, and you see how everything is getting built. Everything is under construction in our local Bangladeshi way. No cranes, only handmade bamboo structures. But you see the mosque in that. And interestingly, as I was mentioning earlier, that um, the community took part in the entire project because I think it's important to get the community engaged in whatever capacity possible. It is important for the health of the building because once I've built it, I'm gone. I haven't been there for quite a while. I think the last time I was there was <coughs> when Sarah and uh, Henry was there. They went to visit, and that was the only time, probably, yeah, a few months back. And and the thing is, the people owns the building, and they need to feel that ownership. And it's important that uh, when they become part of it, they take care of it. So, so that's why they uh, they donated whatever capacity they could. Some donated a fan, uh, a tap, <laughs> some tiles, whatever uh, they donated, we took it because that gives a certain kind of a sense.
the swimming water landscape and plantations all around. Uh, that's a one type of area. We get three crops a year, so which is really fertile. And this is during the winter season. This is our main palm trees, by the way. This is so different from what you see here as day crops. I mean, we don't get any dates, by the way. There are dates, but the dates are Bangla, the Bangalore form actually developed. So 
the bundles of what we actually you know the word bangla came from the word bangla roof and the, it was something the british actually during the colonial time created and which actually traveled all over the world so this roof form is quite unique and you don't see that in the landscape anymore and then you also have uh, every child in bangladesh you ask them to draw a village this is a kind of an image that we draw uh, very idyllic image of a village home and then of course all the textures that you find in the landscape so from we basically created uh, much more concrete uh, design idea where you would like to bring in people, where the goods will be delivered, and what my earlier plan looked like later on when we did the survey of the villages uh, became something much more, uh, much more spread out, and we took this idea of a village home and created. Uh, the huts in a certain way that to create these courtyards and spaces. These are some of the plans, some of the spaces that we designed, the restaurant, uh, the reception area, the spa. And the other thing what we did is we involved the local communities that are living around the site. So this young man, he's from a potter's village, and uh, he's a potter's son, but um, he never learned pottery because pottery doesn't bring him enough money. So he is now finishing his studies, wanting to go to Dhaka, become the next, you know, one of these 20 million people, and um, do some kind of a job. And he thought, you know, it would be much better if we could keep them in their own location. So this is his landscape where his family is from. That's his grandfather working in pottery. And you see over there that image that he is standing. Basically, we employed him. We talked to him. We said we need some quarters. This would be the design. He went back to his grandfather and he said, Well, this is what we're looking at. Can you produce? So it's a connection that was created that was actually not there because he does not have the pride in what his family uh, or the crafting industry that produced. So that pride was lost. So we thought that it would be interesting to work on the Pride project. So bring back what is uh, your identity, what is your Pride. And so we worked on it. We involved the villagers and we started a construction which is mud and entirely built with mud because the construction in that location is all in mud. So we basically took sun dried mud bricks we used mud as plaster and we constructed the entire uh, resort uh, with mud and earth and bamboo. And the entire villagers, I mean, we did the planning, but the villagers took part in construction. So the whole thing is being built by the villagers. So it's creating an economy which is very much uh, around that area. We brought back that roof form. And we brought in people who actually have the technology of doing thatching, which you don't see anymore. So these people are only surviving people who know how to do the thatching process. We have women who are working in the site. Women with the best plasters, actually, with mud. And here they are working, I mean, taking a break after work. And this is how you see, I mean, you don't see architecture. There is no architecture, there is no me <laughs> present on the side. I always think that I'm invisible in this project. So this is what you see during the uh, winter months, dry, the water has gone down. This is during the monsoon when the water is coming up. So the landscape changes, uh, but it's something which is much more of the place. And it's beautiful to stay in a mud house. Uh, during the summer months, it's absolutely cool. Um, you don't feel the dampness once you're inside. And during the winter times, it's much more warmer. It's really, I, I think it's really unique. So what have we have done, I mean, this is just a construction process. What do you do afterwards? So that was another thing which we looked into and the project is actually the resort is called Pani Gram. Pani means water, Gram means village. It's a water village. And
And um, what we have done is we created an initiative where we are giving the craft diversification workshops because there are all these craft villages surrounding the site. So there are there are potters, there are weavers. So we are giving them different uh, diversification sort of courses so that they can make products which they can sell to the uh, guests who will be coming to the resort. We are creating savings group, which is very important because this is where my $2,000 home projects come in. Because people save money, they save $1 a week, and that's quite a lot actually for villagers. So they, and these are like groups, uh, 20 people, 20 women, these are women, 20 women in a group, uh, each one contributing $1 a week. And they have, by now, after two or three years, they have actually collected a number of quite a good sum of money. And the resort then puts in some money. That becomes their seed fund. And from that seed fund, these community I and mean, those savings groups are given loan. <coughs> they give it to, to a $2,000 loan to make a house. And these are uh, two story, uh, well, could be two story, one story. Bedrooms and a bathroom. And you can do your kitchen, then you have to add a little bit more money, but with $2,000, there's two rooms and a bathroom. And a bathroom is a must, you have to get a bathroom, otherwise you don't get a room. So this is how we've done, and then we created maps, the maps are not there. This is how the whole system works. So there are savings group, that's us, and then slowly as the crop progresses, the savings group will be much more larger, and they will have the know how of building. And where do we come in as architects? We give them the knowledge that we have of building and laying out of a, of a build, build form in, in the minimum capacity of a with $2,000, how you get a nice house. So that's where we come in. Here you see the process and that process of making maps. And then they come up with their own models, their own designs. So that's one of their own design. These are some of the houses. That one up there, you see, that house is uh, made out of fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, so this is one of the projects. What is two thousand dollars? It's basically a three thousand road for a villager, and that's a lot actually. And this is when my students from Harvard University they designed two thousand dollar homes. That was their course. <laughs> in my studio. Uh, they visited. And basically visiting the already built fifteen hundred dollar homes, they took part in the uh, in hands-on workshop, learning the materials that are there, how to build with hand. They also enjoyed their stay in Bangladesh. Um, but these are some of the projects that has come up uh, from the studio of uh, Harvard um, GSD studio that I did, and. Um, we have selected five projects from this. This will be built on site uh, in next December. So, which I think is a kind of unique uh, collaboration between the client and the architect. So, the students and the clients basically sat together. They, they tried to understand their aspiration. Here, in this, especially in this specific project, the idea was that uh, you have to listen to the client. Their aspiration is more important than we giving them, giving them the idea. Because uh, you need to learn uh, that they don't need an architect. They're not looking for your advice. But it's us who need to actually give them a certain design and to show them that if you take the advice of an architect, you can, with that small sum of money, what you could do, you could even do it better. You can have better understanding of the material, better layout. So it's our job to show them what architects can do. So that's why the idea was that you do not push your ideas onto the client, but you come together and you actually participate in the process, you make them part of it. So that's how the entire thing worked. I'll show you a little bit of Bangladesh. And I will end it here with this video.
So, uh, you know, we plan to uh, organize a tour, to a study tour to some of my best projects in Bangladesh sometime this year. So, if people are interested, they can register their interest at some point with us. And I think it will be wonderful to visit your projects. Thank you so much, Marina. And we'll move ahead and uh, it's a panel discussion, and I have to read out a few things. So, give me a minute. Thank you. 
So think of that as more framework. Uh, perhaps I can ask if you have this talk about the way in which there were response to what is this notion of pre-skills that the ability of their products, the way in which they think of their products beyond
we are taking them all to Venice. Hopefully, the shipment is tomorrow. <laughs> so, hopefully, we'll be taking that and sort of choreographing a way to to express this whole idea of uh, uh, of the notion of free space. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a perfect segue to my next question, which actually relates to. The, a universal phenomenon like the courtyard, because we can find the courtyard in different cultures, in different places, at different times. And then the specificity of use and how it comes into being, how it takes on being. And so perhaps if you could speak about this universal phenomenon, I would go back also to questions, formal questions that in some cases have been beautiful. The Nine Square, for example. The Nine Square found in Renaissance Italy with Philip Capra, and then the Nine Square as used in mosques, for example, in Google architecture. So this adaptation of universal ideas into, and they become place specific and take on kinds of So perhaps for me, if you to talk about, let's say, this idea of courtyard in the work that you're doing and, um, yeah, to, to articulate some of those. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, talking specifically about this culture, I mean, in relation to the courtyard, then we are talking about the going to be the, uh, the, the universal zone. I mean, in this culture, definitely the courtyard has been developed based on the number of social, environmental values of the people in this part of the world. Uh, it's, I mean, we know the history that has almost acted as a kind of uh, being an element, uh, an element to create a different uh, living environment for the people within the, uh, uh, within the house. So it used to be the, uh, the court used to act as a function used. You live in one side of the house rather than the other side of the house uh, at different time of the day, seasons, and at the same time it was meant as a use of the privacy for the people as well as, the, uh, as, as, well as being the uh, environment and so on. Having said that, I mean, looking at different cultures, I think, uh, again, this courtyard has, uh, the, the, the notion of the courtyard has been repeated. I mean, as, as Maria mentioned, again, it was the idea of this kind of the, 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 the freedom uh, the belief. If you go to uh, the, uh, uh, looking at Barcelona, where you have the courtyard, it becomes, in a way, act, act as a kind of an urban, Phenomenon. But at the same time, it's always it creates this sensation of space, this sensation of being belong to a, a particular place. It's a free space. It kind of creates this kind of this notion of an open public space, depending on what it is. Uh, I mean, here, I mean, as you see, even in, I mean, if I want to just refer to some of these some of these diagrams, the the notion of the courtyard had, it, had always a series of scales, whether it's from an architecture, which defines the public and private, to city, to between space, where it becomes the public space, where it becomes the notion where people get to the level, it used to be the souk, and almost this frees of space that almost changes program over time and allows for different activities to happen. And I think that's why maybe the reason you see it, it repeats in different culture, in different parts of the world, and in different form and different, I would say, notion. Well, courtyards, I think you find it everywhere on earth, right? Uh, starting from the north, I mean, even cool countries. Uh, in Europe, you find courtyards. Just the scale is different, the use is different. The reason of its being there is different from when it is, let's say, in a, in a hot, arid climate or in a tropical climate. But it's everywhere. I think it's, a, it's an outdoor room for me. It's an outdoor room. If you can be within a confined space or you can be outside. And then the outside is basically, courtyard is for me an outdoor room in a certain way. And, and the thing is, um, I mean, the uh, it's, it's basically a space, I mean, even if you consider a human body, let's say, uh, the anatomy of a human or any other animals, there is a void inside you as well. And that void is necessary for your own uh, functionality. Uh, as a as a being, so 
OTRs for me is that thing that gives you uh, that entire Venus. OTRs are almost like a soul of a of a of any place, and it, it just did not came out of nowhere. It came out of a, a functionality uh, when architecture was still being built by uh, let's say master builders from uh, let's say from the early times on. You see Portia, but as the cities developed, and when cities became, you know, even even in older Dhaka, as I see, there were still these courtyard houses. But then when developers came in, and they started taking on the cities and creating uh, residential and you know all those developments, courtyards don't bring you money; they don't sell. You know, if you just fill it up with stacks of floors, they give you more money. So then courtyard was gone. So in a way, that's important to see that the values of living, meaningfully values of living uh, in a quality environment sort of has been taken away by making architecture into a commodity. So that's also something I think we need to understand, commodification of architecture. If I may just add one thing on uh, the idea of the, of the setting of curved courtyard, this is a private thing. I, I personal experience I had the first house we designed was a private family house where it has six or seven courtyards in the house. So when we started to invite in the guests and the family had a very difficult time answering the question why we didn't build more rooms instead of the courtyards. And the, uh, so it, it, it took a bit of time for the people within the family to come in and to, to see the use of the courtyard that they become an extended of the interior uh, space into the outdoor where people could during the good time of day because it's outside it, it starts to take different function of the house. Whereas that you see that not only the family, even the extended family member almost that became a social place or active place for them. So they have once a week or once a month different groups they come in. And they specifically they mentioned that we would love to meet in the court rather than in the, in the interior space. So so it's quite I think uh, in this culture this notion of the privacy and being inside and, 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 uh, and outside, uh, but at the same time, an openness and the open environment uh, in a way it's kind of deeply kind of people like it uh, in the country. Speaking of developers, and no offense to anyone here, developer, um, but if we look at the case of Dhaka and Dubai, and we've talked about place specificity and, and the way in which, um, and, and I, I think in both cases, an advocacy for a place specific architecture that, that addresses the issues of context. If we return to the cities of, of Dhaka and Dubai and perhaps your thoughts on some of the challenges to a place specific architecture, to maintaining a place specific approach uh, today, in the face of rapid urban growth, the kinds of economic forces that you alluded to uh, that ultimately impact the production of architecture. So if, if you could talk about your own experience of some of those challenges to context specificity uh, within the context that you work. Well, and, and towards the beginning of the development industry, which was in the 90s in Dhaka, Definitely, uh, there was a lack of this idea that uh, where you know this was more profit driven in a way. But now, when you look at it, uh, things have changed a lot because the developers are becoming much more aware that if you want to give quality environment to people, it's not just you know. Uh, it, I mean, profit can be made in different ways, and um, it's not always about just profit. It's also about the quality uh, that enhances life. So uh, we see a, quite a, a shift into this whole industry. In many ways, uh, developers are also looking into other ways of uh, doing the projects where they are thinking about terraces, they're thinking of this outdoor room, which I'm talking about, that you need an outdoor room, you need space to breathe, uh, to let nature come in. So those things are there. And, um, and so, well, basically, the thing is, uh, in Bangladeshi context, which is interesting, is that um, 
when you go for more, you know, faster production of uh, architecture, uh, if you take in, of course, you see these glass and steel buildings, which are the fastest of them all, but people sort of reject them. Uh, and now that they see that you, they age much faster than a regular, let's say, a brick building or even a concrete building, uh, there is a sort of a rejection of these materials, which are, uh, you know, not that, not just environment friendly, but also the fact that they, they need more maintenance, though they claim they don't, they don't but glass needs a lot of cleaning, and if you don't clean it, it looks much more, um, you know, uh, old in a certain way. So, uh, if you look into the development industry in Dhaka, uh, there is much more construction uh, with brick, with uh, concrete, so the materials of that nature is uh, probably also the architects are pushing towards materials which are of the location rather than going for industrial materials. Uh, that has driven a lot and if you go to Dhaka, I think you, you see the difference even in developer projects. Well, I mean, it's, it's, in, in Dubai, the, um, the architecture development has been looked at more of an industry. So it's, it's a way to create an economy rather than the actual need uh, uh, for the society. Um, so, so, so that's why in mean, looking at the development, the developers, there's always the economy is, is quite really important. The speed, uh, the speed, whether it's, I would say, speed of the design and the speed of the uh, uh, construction uh, and, and, and maximizing the way to, uh, uh, the way to regenerate or to generate more revenues is quite very important. Uh, for the uh, for the developer uh, here in the world, and besides that, then you have the notion of kind of uh, being very global place. So it's a place where you have people from everywhere living and from everywhere they're working. You have people they're designing for Dubai that even maybe they haven't visited or they have visited the city once. Uh, so I think all of that will bring. Uh, we see the kind of this progressive kind of culture uh, in Dubai where what you have. What you see now, so it's quite um, uh, the speed and kind of uh, the idea of how you generate architecture as a product, rather than kind of as an, a very particular place-specific architecture, uh, I would say. Uh, but I mean, it's, which is in a way, in, in, I would see the kind of a, a big a difference with Dhaka. I mean, Dhaka is a city that is one of the unique cities that, that you see. I would say the most interesting individual interesting architecture as you drive or walk through the city almost every building is unique the way the bricks the glass the concrete the materiality in general the way it comes together and the way the the, the architects they articulate uh, every building and when i was talking to people they say they said architect here they are very very strong in their opinion uh, in that area. and uh, we quite take a long time to interview architects to choose the right architect because when we selected them, we know they do what they want to do. <laughs> so, so that, and I think, I think that somehow it shows very strongly uh, in, within the city and the way the architecture has developed uh, to, to, to respond to uh, kind of uh, uh, the place specific. Uh, All right. Thank you. I think now I would like to open it up. If anyone from the audience has any questions, ask. Uh, yes? So, when I came to the opening of the show earlier this week, uh, I had an interesting conversation with both of you, uh, where you talked about the difficulty in getting clients who have to believe in you, yes, and, and your view about that. So when I see both of you on stage, um, I see this very, diff this very different view of you from your society. Right? So two years out of school, they believed enough in you to let you build the, 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 the project in the middle of the middle of the park. And in your case, you talked about it, it, it's, 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 a, it's been a challenge for you to get people to believe in this, in your view of architecture. So I, I'd like to hear a bit more about that. I mean, uh, when we 
did travel last time to Megalades, actually we were surprised, to be honest, at the level of uh, uh, architecture that you see there, uh, even day-to-day -day architecture, I mean, apartment buildings, normal houses, and so forth, and quite really fascinating even if you compare it to uh, older cities like uh, Mumbai or uh, other kind of uh, close cities in that region. So, uh, I wanted to understand I mean, how this is possible. Uh, there is no so much highlight that there is really great architecture in Bangladesh. And obviously, we can set some kind of a tone or legacy for architects there. It's very obvious that they are proud of it, they even put it in their uh, you know, money currencies. Um, so, when I, I started to be curious, really asking people, uh, normal people, developers, whatever people, I really noticed a, a sense of kind of deep sensibility and understanding of the importance of architecture. I don't know where that comes from, to be honest. Maybe it's history or uh, culture, uh, uh, because I would just fly there and went. And there is a kind of a discussion and debate with normal people. Oh, you guys, designers are great for this kind of appreciation that architects want to do. This is a positive appreciation that architects want to do something different and beautiful. Uh, here, this is not, not the case. Um, um, uh, the first question is a very commercial question. Uh, uh, it's not about really making a legacy or making something different or uh, showing, let's say, culture, but rather than how much money it can make and how much it costs. I mean, definitely it's a very important question that we, uh, we have to answer. But uh, uh, that uh, aspiration of doing something uh, and, and, and the realization that architecture is more than just making a building is really uh, missing. And this is maybe, as you see, part of our, let's say, journey is a very kind of uh, uh, a forceful, uh, let's say, uh, trying to force really uh, a practice of, of design rather than there's a kind of environment to make it really uh, flourish. So we 
uh, had a very hardcore modernist curriculum, <laughs> which probably still follows. Um, but uh, I think what it has done in this, uh, when I got into school, it was still a question, who designs buildings, civil engineers or architects? I mean, this notion of architecture as a practice was still not uh, there. So I'm, I'm talking about the late 1980s or 1990, 1991 and all that. And around that time also people were debating who is an architect, who is an engineer, where do you draw the line? But from that time to this time, I think things have changed a lot. And I, I would say that it definitely we have to give credit to the architecture community. They have really uh, proven their perseverance into the profession. Uh, still a profession which is highly revered in the country. Uh, you know, what people talk about that, you know, once the client architect takes the responsibility, they're quite, you know, very uh, strict about the design that they're doing to maintain it. I think this all came as a culture, and now, um, even if you design a small thing, people go to an architect. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, something why we have to give credit to the architects that they have been able to create. So even then, we do have a lot of debates among ourselves, which is the right kind of architecture, which is not, which is more contextual, which is not. So there is uh, a lot of debate, debate, even though you see a, a good architecture, a, a thriving architecture scene in Bangladesh. And the economy is in progress. So when the economy do, does well, we definitely have a lot of construction, a lot of architecture projects that goes on. But I would say the entire period goes to Bangladeshi architects, um, and especially with the solid base formed by Azhar Islam. Yeah, we have an uh, exhibition going on now in, in Basel, the Swiss Architecture Museum on the selected architects of Bangladesh, uh, which is really very much, I mean, it's a traveling exhibition starting from Switzerland. People travel through all of Europe. So if you are anywhere in Europe, in Switzerland, please go and visit. Uh, other questions? Yes. Thank you, and thank you for the wonderful lecture. We, we miss the simplicity of architecture. Um, I have a question about the communities that you're working with. I come from the Caribbean, so regarding Monsoons, we have hurricanes every year in Puerto Rico, which was devastated last year by Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma. But we don't have this, this um, I would say it's cultural, we don't have this culture of assembling people together to, embed, to do this in the communities. Is this, it, these are two questions in one. Is, are you the agent of these communities in the sense that you're the one who plan as an architect? Not only I do the building, but I'm also the agent of, of communication between these communities. That's number one. Number two, does the government um, give some help to these communities to have possible future projects? Or how do I keep these projects working? So it's to you as an agent, the government also uh, uh, as an agent of environment. Thank you. Well, um, we do work as an agent, yes, uh, because it, it's actually, the, it's a very communal society anyway. I mean, people do interact. They're, they're, they live in communities, so uh, the values of community is very much present. And we basically use that in a certain way. Uh, this uh, savings group thing, this was definitely not there. They don't, they never did this saving collectively. This is, they always have, you know, you know, Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank is quite, you know, so um, those, uh, microfinancing is there. So these are all individual financing. But what we've seen, uh, especially when Grameen Bank started, it definitely did its own. And, and it really did quite a lot in the development of the uh, overall economy and, and people's living and livelihood, but what we see now is that at times the loan is so much and then they cannot repay the entire thing that microfinancing is really not helping in that sense, especially if you go to the grassroots level. And so then we thought that this is a better way of, when you have a collective 
community. Uh, and the money stays with you. You don't give it to a bank. You can put it, put the money in a bank when it's a larger amount. Then they open the account, they put it in the bank. They all have an account. I mean, these 20 people all have a separate account of their own. So the money is going to the bank at the end. But it's their own money. It stays with them. And when they take a loan out of it, let's say you take $2,000 out of it, you basically pay it back in, in five years' time. So you pay your $1 every week. On top of it, you pay a, an extra uh, to pay back the loan. So the money stays with them. So we basically, we said that we don't want your money. We don't want anything. We just want you to start saving so that you have enough. And I think when you have a collective system, it gives a power. And if you go visit these places where they already built the houses, you will see the immense energy and the power and the confidence you have. Because these are women actually who are saving money. And they are the ones who are building the houses. They go to the uh, brick hills, negotiating the prices. They buy the bricks. They employ the contractors. They do everything on their own. So it's an enormous power that they, you know, the confidence that they actually generate among people. So we basically work as an agent and in the beginning we know that this is a, yeah, it's a, it's a task. You have to constantly motivate them, constantly tell them that you need to keep doing this, you have to do this and then once they understand the whole process and it's, we've seen that we, us as agents is more better when we have the other communities who has already developed this because there are a few communities who has already built houses. So they become a better agent than us because they have already seen. So we make these tours uh, to where the communities are located. We take them and when they see it uh, up close, that like, okay, this is a house which was built with $2,000 and this is what the process was. And they talk among themselves and I think the connection is much more uh, you know, useful than me telling them, please save money. You know? So that works. And the government really, uh, we don't, <laughs> I mean, and sitting and waiting for the government to do something is not a wise thing to do. That's what we figured out. <laughs> so we start doing things on our own. Um, and then eventually, if it's something good, the government picks it up. And I think quite often policies follow uh, the other way. It's not a top-down process, it's more like a bottom-up process where you do the things the government sees and then and picks up something. And I think it's a much better and much more sustainable uh, practice when you do a bottom-up process than top-down process. That's much more uh, sustained things that, that works out. A final question. We can have two. Well, th thank you for the presentation, first of all. Uh, first of all, uh, in my very short uh, three years of experience in manufacturing, I've been fortunate enough to uh, go to several cities and work in different places. And I have a very small addition to this uh, topic we were talking about earlier, which is uh, I think the loss of crafts, craftsmanship in cities, this adds a lot. Uh, besides a lot of actual problem losing free space in cities. So uh, this is why we result in profits fighting for uh, uh, like a lot of the ideas to give to the clients. So what do you think about this? The loss of the client and how does this affect the city, especially in the middle? Let's take let's actually take both class questions and we can address them. Thank you. This is more, I, I don't want to know the context that you're working, natural ventilation, using the traditional materials is so inherently rooted. But in a context like ours, where it is controlled by regulations, where you have such controlled environments, how do you break through that challenge when it comes to convincing an authority about Close to prospect or a material, a traditional material that you want to explore that beyond using what you find that you So I think these questions, if I may, that Marina can address the question of 
craft uh, as it relates to the architecture of dialogue, especially in a rapidly urbanizing. And then perhaps, because that last question I think was related to the local content. And so how does one overcome this propensity or almost demand for active measures to control the climate and return to perhaps some understanding of the way in which we can use passive measures as, as climate responsive in the face of all the other forces? So, so let me uh, understand the question. We're talking about that the crafts are losing, we're losing craft in the in the local context, uh, I mean in the, in the urban context? Yes, is that in the cities in general, and then it affects the whole city. In the city. Yes, yes it does, sure. It has to do with the construction industry, of course, and the, and the pace of construction, I think. Uh, we want everything fast. Uh, we design it, we want the building to be done, in, if possible, the next day. <laughs> so, and crafting takes time. So that's where the problem is, the, the, the pace at which we are moving. I think um, whether it's healthy, we need to address that. I think it's not healthy to move too fast, is it? Um, because, you know, we can, within our lifetime, do a certain thing. You have to leave it for the next generation to do the next. If you want to do everything in your own one lifetime, I don't think that's a very healthy uh, way of looking at things. So um, I think we need to question ourselves as a profession, as architects, um, that how fast that you really need to move. We need to question that as a society. Um, those who employ architects, those who are living in cities, I think. Um, crafting is important, definitely. That gives the notion, the quality of, of, a, of, a, of being alive, rather than living in a, you know, I mean, I've, I've stayed in places everywhere on earth, and wherever you see there is this crafted spaces, that's what gives you the memory, that's what you remember. Rather than going and staying in a business hotel for two nights, you don't remember anything. It does not give you any memory. So memories are important. A city has a memory, a city itself has its own. Memory. So I think those are values which are not there, just missing because of the capitalist society and the consumer culture that we have created ourselves. Um, hopefully, we should be able to bring those values again into the cities. And I think it's for the younger generation to to address that. I'm old. <laughs> Genius logic. And without the research, we can't do any architecture. And I was working in a company until one month ago, and I left this company because I work in an important master plan of the UAE. And uh, for me, the research is really important, and also work with the community. I agree with you that the memory is important. The survey is much more important and to talk with the people it's important because without a house we can't have any future. Anyway, at the end someone has to pay something and if you spend a lot of time on the research you don't have any money for months or you can work in this way.
which we do know that's important. Yes, every project has to make money. Uh, every project has to make the time. Every project and all this has to happen. But at the same time, the architects, instead of like being the, the leading process of the design, it becomes one element within that cycle where you're only an element of the design. So you have to, you're, you're almost equal to all the other layers that, 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 that anyway has to be done. And that, with that, it comes a lot of compromise uh, of the design. Uh, I mean, based on, based, on, based on the experience, in many cases, at the end, neither the time nor the budget is made, uh, but at the same time, the design has been, that, that has been compromised. Now, yes, there are ways, okay, there are ways, but I think that has to go back for, from the day one, I would say even being very technical from the way you do the procurement of the project, that's important. How you, in this particular context, because it's very, it's becoming very heavy, this kind of how you hire architects, the contract, the procurement process, the tendering process, and, 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 and. And all of that will start to take some element of creativity, because all this element will put you in a, in a position that the design has been preconceived. So you have to follow that preconceived idea. So in order for you to be able to design to be something place specific, something sensible, you have to have this dialogue at very early stage. You should, before you always in a way get into the project, which is more important to open up the discussion, how the right procedure should be done, what should be the role of architecture, how the team should be, should be set up and, and so on. Then you start to bring in all the other elements into it, which is time management and you know, the technicality and, 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 and so on. So I mean, this is one approach where then definitely, I think, if a client is buying into it, then you build the process to make the right architecture out of it. But if you start from the wrong process, no matter how much you want to start to be you know, patient, to start to be educating client, you have documents, you have contracts which start to push you back. It's become much more stronger than kind of your, uh, uh, your, your, your creativity. I don't get what on a sour note, but any last comments, except positive comments, for me about um, maybe wrapping up our discussion today, any sort of summary statement, and then I think we can continue the discussion over food, which is always good. So, sure. So, yeah. I mean, look, having now been in the industry almost for 15 years, um, um, the projects we see here, this project is very tough. Um, the client approached us in 2005 saying, yeah, let's do sustainable master plan. And that's before Mazda comes in. And, um, I mean, all this discussion about sustainability becomes, uh, um, becomes a fight and so on. So this was, in a way, it's, it's a process that we started from day one to define what could be the right approach and so forth. But definitely since then, I would say the industry has developed so much. Uh, you see lots of uh, kind of this, uh, uh, the approach, the right approach, if you kind of build sensibility, the sustainability, environmental cultures, and so forth, from day one has been developed and been part of the culture of the development. So there's a lot of, in many cases, these discussions are coming up. In many early cases, you've developed like bodies like UPC that they have amazing guidelines, uh, whether at the architecture level, at the architecture typology level, all the way where it comes to uh, and, and in a way other bodies across the, the city. So there has been quite a progress. I mean, the way that the construction has been very progressive, I would say the knowledge and the way the industry is building knowledge has been quite uh, progressive uh, uh, in this society in the last, I would say, 15 years. Okay, um, last comment. <laughs> um, well, basically, the work that I have shown, or the work I do, is much more based in the context of Bangladesh. <clears throat> so, the climate, the clients, uh, we don't have electricity in the summer months, let's say, for three to four hours at times, because, you know, you just don't have it, because it's, a, it's being flat land. We need, we need to generate electricity with gas and quite often it's not enough for the entire country so so we need to you know make focus on where you want to give electricity 
So during cultivation periods, it's more to the villages. During so the government tries to make these plants or to give electricity. So, so at times in summer months, uh, for three four hours, you don't have it. So we don't have the luxury of uh, being in an air conditioned space all the time. So the building needs to operate on its own. So that's something as a challenge. And every building in Bangladesh, if you look at it, every architect needs to make the buildings operate on its own. So that's something that comes um, through our training as architects from the school onwards. So uh, without air conditioning, every building will operate. So that's our challenge. <laughs> I'm sure Dubai has its own challenges, being uh, you know starting from the contract or anything. Challenges are everywhere. It just changes the, the shape and the size and the complexity. Um, I think uh, as architects, the, we need to address that. And the solutions have to be intelligent, intelligent enough to to take in, uh, you know, and come out as a manifestation in terms of design and the process of design. So the design calls for intelligence. Design calls for innovation, keeping the challenge in mind. So. Yeah, I just hope that I just shared my views of how I have done in my context. I'm sure there are ways of doing it, and these beautiful, you know, projects actually show that architects are thinking about it. So, thank you. So, I'll end with a plea for intelligence, and thank you, Marina, for a wonderful lecture, and Marina and Fourier for a great discussion. Thank you very much.